A lot of food for thought in that report. Uh, to pick over it, let's uh, speak to, uh, in London, to Sunny Kapoor, Managing Director of Policy Think Tank Redefine. Thanks for being with us here on, on France 24. Uh, first of all, uh, you saw the thumbs up from uh, the officials in Brussels and the grumblings of the International Monetary Fund. Uh, has uh, Have the Greeks gotten uh, m away with uh, uh, mere pledges at this point? Well, I mean, what's really important is that there is substance, and the substance this time, unlike previous agreements and discussions, has been put forward partly by the Greek government. And I think this point of principle is hugely important, because Syriza was brought in to express the democratic desire of Greek people, and if it had come away with absolutely nothing in the way of compromises or concessions, that would have sent a terrible message to the European electorate and encouraging the rise of far-right uh, anti-European parties. So Syriza has got important concessions in terms of the uh, services to be delivered to the bottom most, uh, you know, the, the, those who have suffered the most during the crisis. It has got concessions in terms of taking stronger action against tax fl uh, capital flight as well as tax avoidance and corruption in exchange for easing of some of the privatization requirements, easing of some of the pension requirements, etc. But we, so uh, sorry, let, Sonny, let me interrupt forward. you on that point. Uh, we've heard that promise before from previous Greek governments that they would crack down, for instance, on tax evasion. What's different about this one is, for the first time, a party is in power that has not been part of, historically, uh, Greece's clientelist state. Both Endi as well as PASOK, which have alternated in governments, were part of a huge clientelist state which doled out state contracts and rewards, etc. This is a bunch of guys who have no previous experience of government. And yes, they started out far left, but at least their hands are clean for now. So if anybody were to credibly deliver on those anti-corruption promises, these guys actually have the potential. They may still fail. We don't know that. But at least as a starting point, there's a reason to be hopeful. But you do understand uh, Christine Lagarde's position at the IMF. When you go over that list of pledges from Yanis Varoufakis, they seem virtuous. But uh, for now, it's just promises. Yes, that's exactly. And there is no way of knowing whether those will actually be delivered on. And that's the whole point. The next few months are crucial. The next few weeks are crucial. And this is one of the things that Syriza has got from this compromise. It has got itself a little bit of breathing room to demonstrate that, yes, it can win elections, which it has, but can it govern? Nobody knows the answer to that. And the answer will be clearly uh, starting to be visible over the next few weeks. Everybody will be scrutinizing what they say and do very closely. So they have got not a fair chance, but half a chance, with one hand tied behind their back, because the creditors have not given them too much space. But it is important that they should be judged on their record, not on their rhetoric. And now there is a chance that that might happen. All right, you say uh, one hand tied behind their back. Uh, for instance, we saw in that report uh, that it's still very much up in the air whether or not they're going to privatize the big port of Piraeus. Should that be done? Well, I think that there is something wrong with selling all your prized assets at fire sale prices exactly at the time when your economy is most depressed. So Syriza had an important point it was making that it now is not the time to sell those assets. But I think for those sales that are already in the pipeline, it is perhaps OK and better to go ahead in terms of respecting the sanctity of promises and contracts. But it has won an important concession to do privatization in order to maximize long-term profits. That's the statement that is crucial. So expect the pace of privatization to slow down after what is already in the pipeline is dealt with. And hopefully the government can then manage and clean up some of the way many of these state-owned assets are managed and where it makes sense to sell them at actually good prices, not the fire sale prices that it is able to get as of today because of the crisis. All right. So, Sunny Kapoor, you're saying that uh, one of the big differences, obviously, is there's fresh faces at the table representing Athens. Uh, you, you also penned a piece uh, on your website 
uh, called uh, The Greek Deal, A Game Changer or a Mere Name Changer, in which you, you point out that um, instead of there being three main players on the uh, creditor's side, this time there's only two, the IMF and uh, the Eurozone, not so much the ECB. What does that change? Well, the ECB historically, due, within the Troika, was the most hawkish on a number of issues, particularly on austerity and on fiscal policy. And the IMF was the other end of the spectrum, saying, no, no, we need a somewhat looser fiscal policy. So the fact that the European Court of Justice has, in its opinion, said the uh, ECB should not be part of Troika, combined with the aggressive stance taken by the Syriza government means that in the near future, particularly for the longer-term agreement that Greece needs after April, the ECB will play a much less important role. And, and why, that will why probably is that? Be... Why is the ECB playing, uh, taking more of a backseat? Well, one, the ECB itself has realized that it has stuck its neck out far too much. It is politically exposed. It is not supposed to have strong opinions on what a government should and shouldn't do. It is an independent central bank, and the price of that independence is that it sticks to monetary policy. But the letters that have been leaked by the Irish government, by the Italians, by the Spaniards, sent by the European Central Bank to respective prime ministers with clear instructions and implicit threats, if those instructions were not forward, has done the ECB's reputation and democratic legitimacy a whole lot of damage. That combined with the quantitative easing program, which was important, but is opposed in Germany, means that the ECB has a strong interest in staying out of the headlines for the foreseeable future. And so there is a strong incentive where it itself does not want to be seen to be a big player within the Troika. And I think it's likely that the OECD will, in the near future, play a more important role uh, and will replace some of what the ECB is doing. Sonny Kapoor, earlier our Europe editor was saying that what today shows is we're definitely out of the grandstanding period that followed uh, the, those historic elections that brought the far left to power in Greece. Going ahead from today, would you say Europe is stronger or weaker? I think it has been a refreshing few weeks for those of us who were involved at some point or time or the other in what can only be described as the soul-destroying uh, negotiation processes behind uh, the euro crisis. The past few weeks have been refreshing because substantial issues have been discussed, issues that were swept under the carpet, whether debt is sustainable or not, whether the pace of austerity is excessive, should there be democratic space available to countries, were discussed. In the end, Greece probably uh, did not manage to get most of what it was looking for. And for the most part, status quo has prevailed. But an important precedent has been set. And I know many people will find it surprising, but the mere fact that Greece has the ability to suggest some of its own reforms is kind of revolutionary, given how poorly bailouts were managed in the past, and that governments have had to resign when they have disagreed with the Troika. So this is kind of new. And I think, on the whole, European democracy is a bit healthier. It also means that people know that if they vote for change, you're probably not going to get most of it, but at least you will not be completely bullied into holding another election. So that important precedent, I think, is good for democracy and good for Europe.